Without further ado, I present the Verbatim Theater Project. Homestart has been serving in San Diego for 46 years, and our mission has always been the same, which is preventing child abuse and neglect and strengthening families at risk. This is Laura Tancredi Basie, a licensed clinical social worker and the CEO of Homestart. Neglect. That is the most common type of child abuse you'll see. Interestingly enough, some people think it leaves the most scars initially because you're, you're being hit or being yelled at. At least you're getting some sort of attention versus complete neglect. And many times when you're looking at cases like that, often the parents are drug or alcohol abusing. I will never forget this one house I went into, apartment. And um, we walked in the door and it was filthy. There was uh, like a little, um, a little high chair, so they had a young child, and there was trash all over the floor. There was garbage, food everywhere, it stunk. And they had some, I think kind of a cat. There was cat feces all over the place. It was filthy, and they had a young child living in that. That was horrifying to think that people do that, but oftentimes it's connected to drug or alcohol abuse, where they just don't care about anything except that next high. So it's not an easy subject to talk about. According to the San Diego Health and Human Services Agency, Child Welfare Services, in 2013 to 2014, there were 40,050, 65 child abuse and neglect reports made to the hotline, which represents 75,862 children. How can we create a dialogue around abuse? We have to break the silence. April is National Child Abuse Awareness Month. Talk about it, invite speakers, let's get it out there and let's discuss it. It is a health issue that is not being given the credit and discussion it should be. We talk about cancer, we talk about other kinds of illnesses. Abuse, child abuse, domestic violence is also a health crisis as well. Let's get it out there, let's keep it going. We might save somebody's life who hears this conversation and says, that's what's happening to me. Uh, abuse has impacted me in both ways, negatively and in a positive way. And in that order, ne negative was the first, because it took my self-esteem down to zip. Um, and then secondly, the positive impact has been for me to find myself comfortable with myself in a positive way, where he may have brought my self-esteem down to zero, but I took the time I ne needed to bring it back up. And so, therefore, my self-esteem is better and my ju judgment or my intuition will say, my intuition is better now. This is Jane Doe. Her name has been changed to protect her privacy. She has been affected by domestic abuse. The journey for me was, I was about 20 and I became pregnant with Sarah. So in my head, I'm Number one, I'm a g girl. Number two, I'm Catholic. And number three, um, un unwed. N number one, I should be married. I can't, I should not be pregnant. So I'm trying to take care of all these things. So, and um, the father asks, gives me an engagement ring. Uh, asks me to marry him, and of course I say yes. You get married, and then you live together, and and any job or schooling I was doing was postponed. Uh, we had a case right here in this neighborhood at one of our shelters. A young woman and her gorgeous eight-month-old baby, beautiful baby. Oh my gosh, the chubbiest cheeks, just beautiful. They were living in the back cottage of one of our apartments. She broke up with the boyfriend, the father of the baby. They were both 20 years old. He got drunk, went driving by in the alley in the middle of the afternoon and shot a gun into the unit. Fortunately, it didn't hit her, the baby, or anyone else. He was a gang-associated guy. And that was it. He lost it because she broke up with him. That's the power and control thing. I probably sensed it right from the beginning. There's um, abuse in two separate phases of my life. So it's not that they're interchangeable, but they're the same, the, the same. It's like I picked the same guy again, you 
no, just want to control me. I, I did seek help until I ended the relationship. I had started seeing um, a psych doctor while I was, while we were still to living in the same apartment or the same house. And over the time that I'd seen her and was seeing her, um, I moved out. Sarah and I moved out. Probably halfway through the length of our marriage, I knew I was going to have to, to that this was not going to resolve itself. Um, so I had to set myself up in preparation to, to leave. And I was at the time, the night, the day, the time that I left, I was fully prepared to do it. Yeah. You've heard of the cycle of domestic violence. Everything seems fine. I'll use the typical stereotypes for gender, though it can be other ways as well. Um, we'll say this woman does something the guy doesn't like. He starts to yell at her, and she, you know, tries to make excuses. She's getting angrier, angrier, and angrier. There was an explosion. Uh, she tries to get away from him, and he goes away. Comes back and is very, very sorry. He didn't mean it, you know? It was because your mother was here. Reasons and excuses. I didn't mean to hit you. I'll never do that again. I've never done that before. He brings you flowers. I'm so, so sorry. And then everything is fine until the next time. So a lot of people say that it takes at least seven times for somebody to leave a domestic violence uh, relationship because of that cycle of dependency. I think um, that there is a dependency that gets created oftentimes. And then there is this kind of chipping away at self-esteem. And then the cycle is they're wonderful again. I didn't mean it. I'll never do that again. That sort of thing. They don't have anybody they are reaching out to. They are not feeling confident about themselves. They may not have an income. How am I going to do this? And of course, there is that fear too. You hear the stories. I was afraid he was going to hurt me. I was afraid he was going to hurt my children. Uh, I was afraid he was going to hurt my parents. And um, I've heard that story before as well, where they operate on, you know, power and control. So if I do try to leave, you know. I've come to value the skill of reaching out. And even if it's not skillful, the practice of reaching out. I think it would be really helpful for them to have people who might be able to help. I think they can feel really alone. There's so much shame. And shame likes to tell us that we're bad. This is a marriage and family therapist named Taylor Johnson. Their name has been changed to protect their privacy. Oftentimes, people's biggest wounds are from other people. And isolating and hiding generally don't help. Generally. The way out is through other people. It's not uncommon for people to realize that they have ways of coping with this, that they have some skills around this. It's dehumanizing to be the recipient of acts of violence. So to build up that sense of worth, practicing hope, resilience. I'm really impressed with the resilience of people. It really amazes me. Something that is important for me is understanding that it's okay to say, you know what, I don't like to be treated that way, or I don't like to be spoken to like that that it's okay to end a conversation that's not going well. Like sitting there and feeling like someone is attacking you, you don't have to listen to that. Monday through Fridays, he would just drink beers and then go to sleep. And then on the weekends, he would drink whiskey. This is Mary Smith. Her name has been changed to protect her's privacy. She has been affected by domestic violence and alcohol abuse. My dad would start drinking at maybe 10 o'clock in the morning. And you knew when he started drinking at 10 o'clock in the morning, it was going to be a bad, bad day. Oh, I'm going to Woolsworth and get some hoagie sandwiches. Let's go. Let's go get some hoagie sandwiches. Everything would be great. But then he'd be too drunk. And he'd be swaying and he'd be smacking his lips. And it was just like the storm clouds of a tornado watch. When the storm clouds were forming, it was like that. You were kind of happy when he was passed out because then you didn't have to see all the swaying and his lips smacking and his eyes would be bloodshot red. But if my mom was in a bad mood or he'd be passed out before dinner, my mom would be pissed. She'd wake him up, he'd get angry, and they'd start fighting. Or she'd just wake him up because she's angry, because we're in this house, 
in this small, tiny house, and it's just a boiler cooker. When she'd wake him up and the fight would start, it was like a tornado warning, like a siren. And where my brother and I would open the windows during an actual tornado, tornado warning, we did the exact opposite when my parents started fighting. We went around and we closed all the windows because it was private. We had to keep it to ourselves. No one was to know. So my brother and I were not instructed by our parents at all, but we needed to close all the windows in, our, in the house so no one would hear the fighting. Then we'd go to our respected rooms and the storm would just go on forever. More than 15 million people struggle with an alcohol use disorder in the United States, but less than 8% of those receive treatment. A lot of people will come to the rooms of AA, but just because they come to the rooms doesn't mean they get sober. Sometimes they come to go, but we do what we can to help. Uh, we've got a book, we've got meetings, we've got all kinds of meetings, you know, like stop meetings and speaker meetings, discussion meetings, big book studies, and we feel it's good to mix it up and become part of the fellowship. This is Steve, a representative of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's on the Public Information Committee. Well, when I wanted to drink, there was, there was no one that was really gonna stop me. Now, you may want to try, or rather, you may need to want to help someone, but they're not always going to get help. Sometimes the best thing to do when you get to that point is just leave them alone and let them go down the path they have to take. Now, it's important to know that if you have a family member who's alcoholic, it's not your fault. But we have al -Anon groups that are good for people who have family members that are alcoholics or they just simply have alcoholics in their lives. And it's to help them, it's to help to be powerless over those people. I can remember when I finally came to grips that I was an alcoholic. I had gone to the bar early in the morning on a Sunday, and my friend dragged me out of the bar, and I had one drink. I was just, I was just physically hurt to stop drinking. And it was at that point where I knew I was an alcoholic, but it still took me a couple of years to sober up. When I was active, I got to the point where people just didn't trust me anymore. And my family was worried and I was losing friends left and right. My world was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And since I've gone to AA, it's, it's taken a lot of time. I've been active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been active in my community. And I've been working my job for a long time. Beforehand, I used to do a job every year or two. It's a lot more stable now, and I've learned to accept things the way they are and just walk through life. I think that people don't acknowledge abuse because they care about the person. We might see it as cut and dry because we're outside the situation, but they love that person. They don't want them to be in trouble. There's a cycle of violence. There's escalation, the violence happens, then they apologize and say they're so sorry, but then they get mad again, and oftentimes the victim gets blamed. And that's crazy, but they don't know that that's crazy. We have this way of villainizing people who commit acts of violence, and it makes it so polarized. They're either good or bad, and because they've done some bad things, they're bad. And for that person, that's not true. They can recount times that they've been tender. They can recount times that they felt really good with this person. Everything has another name. For example, beta fish are also known as the Siamese fighting fish. But sometimes it's personal. Like character assassination and verbal abuse. Like a monster, it waits, stalks you like a predator until you're at your lowest point and can't take any more hurt. It slowly consumes you. So you stay quiet and swallow down the bile building up in the back of your throat. You look in the mirror only to find that everything has changed. There are bruises from every time you were told. You're not good enough. You won't amount to anything. You have no future. They have broken you into a million pieces with no hope of anyone being able to put you back together. They have literally taken everything you are, were, and have, or have become and destroyed it with one fatal word. Be careful with your words. You never know how they'll affect the other time. 
it was weird because he would always preach the, you know, women for women or standing up for young girls and lifting each other up, but she was just so opposite to that. And that's, I mean, really sad because I believed it, I really did. And there were times where she would flip the switch on and she would be this really cool, empowering woman, but then something would happen in a split second and you'd be like, oh, she's, I get it now. She's really not that person. It was an act, a total act. This is Christine Carlson. Her name has been changed to respect her privacy. She has been affected by workplace abuse. I worked for this company. It was um, public relations. And when I first applied, I was super excited because I did a lot of research on the company and I realized that it was all women. And I was really kind of intrigued by the CEO. She's only 37, super young, super cool. She was a mom and I was like, oh my God, this is the place I want to work. Like, these ladies seem awesome. So um, I ended up getting the job. I was super excited. And the first week that we were there, that I was there, we were actually moving offices. And um, you know, she basically, she just uh, basically threw me to the wolves and I started right away, I jumped right in and I was in charge of the whole move. I had to do a lot of things I wasn't too sure about. I mean, I've never moved an entire office before, but you know, she acted like I was doing a great job, was really supportive in you know, most cases. And the other ladies that worked for her were super nice, super welcoming, so I was like, so we get to the new place, the move is over and I kind of noticed some things had kind of like changed and I just figured she was nervous about the new space, it was a lot more money for rent um, and she would kind of like snap and say weird things or maybe it was the way that she said them um, and it actually turned out that this CEO who turned out to be this very, <laughs> I used the term evil but it got really, really bad. I was one of five executive assistants that she had had in the last three years, which is a lot. It's <laughs> uh, definitely not a good sign. It's definitely a huge red flag. And um, she would snap at other girls and she even started talking bad about some of the other girls to me and it made me really uncomfortable. And that to me is a huge red flag also. So it turned out that this woman that I had idolized, I was like, I would love to be her. She's so cool, you know, boss lady, killing it. But she was really a mean girl. This took a toll on me as a high school student because I had so much shame, so many secrets that I had this facade. I had this persona at school where I was popular and I was funny and, you know, that was my survival mode because I didn't want people to know really what was going on in my life. And then it got so bad with my dad, his alcoholism, and my parents fighting that they weren't even talking to each other anymore. I broke down my senior year of high school, and after that, I just couldn't function anymore. I hurt, I was very negative, I was depressed, and I just couldn't trust people anymore. Because if I trust people, then they would know all my secrets, and then I was afraid that they would share them. At the end, it got so bad to the point where we had meetings every week in her office privately about how I wasn't happy and about how her communication style wasn't okay with me, so she would be really nice to my face, and then she would send me nasty messages uh, through Google Hangouts or crazy emails in the middle of the night, like 2 a.m., and I talked to a lot of the other girls, and I noticed they were getting a lot of the, the same treatment, a lot of the same type of communication, it was rough. It, it definitely turned out to be a toxic situation. So every day I would go into work and it was like this anxiety. The first time I knew it was gonna be really bad, she used the line, I love you, but I went to this huge rant about how I was doing such a terrible job and all this. It was almost every day, like my anxiety was through the roof. Like she would walk through the door and I didn't know who I was gonna get, whether she was gonna be fake nice to me, whether she was gonna be actually nice to me or whether she was gonna walk right by me. You just, you didn't know. She started blaming me for clients not paying, and at that point, I was like, I've got to get out of here, and I ended up leaving, and I tell her the truth because, honestly, I think she needed to hear it, and in the time that I was there, which was eight months, five girls quit, yeah, 
And in the time that I've been gone, which has been three months, another two girls have quit. So it, it definitely turned out to be a bad situation. Human trafficking is San Diego's second largest underground economy after drug trafficking, bringing in roughly $810 million per year. An estimated 8,000 people are victims of human trafficking in here in San Diego each year. When it comes to victims of human trafficking abuses, they tend to live in the shadows and do not identify themselves as victims. This is Bianca Morales-Egan, Technical Advisor on Human Trafficking, Project Concern International. They have been told over and over again by their exploiters or traffickers that no one will believe them. Um, they better stay away from the police or they will be punished. Um, I heard a story today from a sex trafficking survivor who said that her trafficker literally beat it into her. He would punch her in the face over and over again and, question, and ask her what she would do if a cop ever questioned her. And he would punch her over and over again until she said the right answer, which is basically, I don't say anything. There's a lot of fear. When it comes to sex trafficking of our youth, I believe we should focus on our efforts on how to stop the problem before it begins. We do not want anyone having to live through the horrific experience of trafficking. It causes a lot of long-term damage, which is hard to recover from. So I like, to fo I like to focus on primary prevention efforts that educate our youth and build their emotional support system so they feel they have someone to turn to when and if they are being abused. We are trying to bring awareness of how traffickers find their victims, try to show them how to be safe on their phones, social media, online, because a lot of recruitment of victims happens in these spaces. Uh, we try to build their self-esteem and resilience to empower them to overcome any challenges or abuse they may have already experienced. We don't want them to continue to be, to be vulnerable to traffickers. I believe sex trafficking in particular is a severe form of gender-based violence. It is a way of people showing power over other people based on their vulnerabilities. So I believe we need to start very young, like eight years old, and start talking about gender inequalities and culture influences that make it okay to exploit a girl just because she's a girl, like in movies, magazines, and music. We need to start talking to both our young girls and boys and transgender community about how we must respect each other as human beings. We must allow boys to feel emotion, express emotion, and stop putting unreasonable expectations on them, and stop saying stuff like, man up. We need to teach our young girls that they are worthy, can fulfill their dreams, looks are not their only value, and how to be assertive. I am happy that you are focusing on this topic because I do think it's about taking action and not being a bystander. I think most people, even abusers, would agree that abuse in all of its forms is wrong. We need to empower people to do something about it, we need to and see how culture plays a big role in perpetrating our acceptance of certain types of abuse, especially gender-based violence and sex trafficking. Uh, several people have talked to me about my drinking, just saying stuff that they were concerned for me rather than telling me, you've got a problem. <laughs> Although there, there were people who told me I had a problem, but the best thing to do in that situation is to say, in a loving manner, to that person that you are concerned for them. But try to be there for them. Try to evoke it in a loving manner. Because it's up to them whether they want to do something about it or not. Again, try to be there for them, but try not to enable them. Because that in itself is a very difficult thing to do. Looking, looking back, let's see, 58 and looking back, we'll say uh, 40 years. My, my advice is to take your time. Take your time with every phase of your life. Don't rush through the journey because when I feel that when people do that, they think that things don't go quite as well because they're in a hur hurry and if you would have just taking five minutes to think about it, it might be different. I can tell you from the last 20 years, I don't know, the natural progression of things, like you become wiser, you know, you get o older and it's just you get wiser about, about things. And the way I look at it now, after 20 some years, it's like 
You think your whole world is coming to an end, but it's not. It's really just the start, and you have to, you know, you have to work on yourself. You have to do the kinds of things that you need to do. You, you have to enjoy your own co company. If you can't enjoy your own company, how can anyone else enjoy your company? You know what I mean. So you become comfortable with yourself and, you know, in your mind that your instincts are right. But no, I did come out of it with good relationships with my coworkers, so that's a huge positive. And I learned a lot. You know, uh, I learned a lot about how I'm not gonna let anyone treat me like that ever again. I learned a lot about myself and my own anxieties and how I let other people affect me because she really, really took a toll on me. For like eight months, I was like the most stressed I'd ever been. And this is coming from someone who lived in New York City. <laughs> and I wanted so bad to look up to her. I, I wanted for her to even be like my mentor. I wanted to ask her like how she got to where she was, but she was just so scary. I was terrified of her. I was actually terrified of her. I always try to look on the bright side. Um, and now that I'm in a better situation and can think about it more clearly, I look back and I'm like, I learned a lot. So that's a positive thing. Don't give up. Don't decide that something's not right for you without looking into it first. Because a lot of times people just come into a meeting and then they'll think, this isn't for me. And then they'll just keep doing what they're doing. That's what happened to me. It took me a couple years to get to A and stay at A. Just a couple of years in order for me to finally accept, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought it was. I remember in the beginning running in and trying to solve it and you can't. But the upside for when I got out of it was that I knew what I wanted within a relationship. I knew what was bad, I knew it was good, and I knew what I wanted for my children. I know that I don't want to hide anything. I don't want to. I, y you know there's conflict in everything, but my husband is a wonderful guy, and my family isn't ever going to witness that. I mean, if he was ever like that, I would go up and leave, because I would never want my family to experience anything like that. You know, I tried to tell her. I tried to tell her that her communication style wasn't okay with me, it didn't work for any of her employees or clients, but she was just so stuck in her head that she was basically writing me off and putting the blame on a lot of other people for the way that she was acting. And I just knew at that point that there was no getting through to her and that I was done. And you know, it's really not my responsibility to do that. Even though the other girls that I worked with, they were like, if you leave, you need to tell her exactly how you feel. And I did, I did try, but you just can't get through to some people. I have, I might have two separate things to say to them. One, I'd say, you know what? I'd laugh. <laughs> I was, I, I'd be like, to, to, Tony, you're an ass. You're never go, gonna get it together. You're 60 years old, and you're still fucking around. <laughs> um, and then to Brian, I'm like, good riddance, buddy. You deserve everything you get. We tell. These stories to shed light on the reality of abuse. We, we tell. tell these stories to give strength to those who are trapped in abusive relationships. We, we believe, believe that speaking about abuse is the difference between life and death. We, we believe, believe that sharing your personal truth is an important part of healing. We, we feel that those who have shared their stories are triumphant. We feel that those affected by abuse are resilient. We empower you to get involved in your community and help those who have been affected by abuse. 
We empower. empower. You to continue the dialogue, encouraging those who have felt voiceless. <laughs> we create this web as a reminder that our stories should connect us and bring us together. We, we create this web in hopes that we can carry these stories with us on our journey ahead. And even though we have different backgrounds, I feel like we can all connect to the story. And so we are going to take this web and we invite you to take a piece home with you to continue the dialogue about abuse. Thank <laughs> you.